What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to an all-new episode of the Pack a Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. I am joined once again by the one and only Mike Wall. I don't know about you guys. I've been having Mike Wall withdrawals. I needed to talk to him once again. It's been far too long. There's been a lot of off-season that's happened since we've spoken last. So, Mike, so glad to have you back. How the heck have you been? Andy, great to be back. Good talking to you as always. And uh, yeah, it's been a fun off-season so far. So uh, I think we got a lot to discuss. We have a ton to discuss. It's almost difficult to pinpoint exactly where I want to start, but I do know where I want to start. I want to start at running back. Obviously, we haven't had the opportunity to talk about just about any of this uh, together. I know you've talked about it on your channel. Obviously, I've talked about it on mine, but I just want to pick your brain quick. Uh, obviously, I know that this conversation on a lot of these topics have been dissected already, but Aaron Jones is out. Josh Jacobs is in. It's a pretty aggressive move from Green Bay, moving on from one of their core locker room guys, one of the what they've literally labeled as the heart and soul of the franchise uh, at running back, um, to move on from Aaron Jones, plus seeing him go to Minnesota, and then bringing in a Josh Jacobs. How did you evaluate and sort of reconcile that move for Green Bay? It sucks that you have to make those decisions. Goody... Uh, Listen, the hard thing about it is is you see how good he is and then you it's I you want to you want to dissociate the fact that he was injured for the last two seasons. Yep. And you just want to remember the times he was in. And because he was so effective, he's the best he was the best player on offense because because Bakhtiari hasn't been playing. He's been the best player on offense for the last couple of years. Um he I call him lighter fluid. He was a lighter fluid for this offense. It's certainly down the stretch this last season. I think he was averaged over 5 yards a carry there towards the end the last 5 games. Is, is such there's such a night and day difference from when he's on the field to when he's not that it's it's impossible to think that you would ask him to take a five million dollar pay cut two years ago or last offseason and yep. then another five or six million dollar pay cut this offseason like it, it it's 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 hard to fathom that that would be a realistic expectation um without him without goody just saying outright like i don't want you here anymore for whatever reason i think you're too old etc cetera, etc cetera. so that part of it is kind of difficult to deal with. The, the fact that they brought in Josh Jacobs and, you know, they're replacing your best guy. And I think Matt LaFleur said at some point, like, this dude is the, is the biggest badass on our team. Like, he is our guy, I think, before he was released. Yep. And, and so it's it's hard. Like, all of that is just really, really difficult, I think, from a locker room standpoint, from a player standpoint, knowing how valuable he is to, to see him go. I think that's I think that's really, really tough. But having said that, <clears throat> Josh Jacobs is a really good player. I think he was second team All-Pro maybe two years ago before he got – I think he went through some injury bug last year. But he's a guy that – you know, he's 223 pounds. He's hard to tackle in the open field. He's a different style player, but it's not that different that you can't close your eyes and see them running the same stuff. Yep. I think what's interesting now – and this is always kind of the, the fun thing to think about when you're thinking about you know personnel decisions versus coaching decisions – you definitely had this difference in style between Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon. And interesting that they brought AJ back. Good decision, bad decision. I'm really agnostic about it. But there was definitely a difference. Yep. And you could always go like, well, AJ gets stronger as the season goes on and you know, downhill running when it's cold, blah, blah, blah. Now you've kind of got like a really, really good version of AJ and Josh. Like he's just a better player. And so I don't know where they get is it Patrick Tan who is it that or is it a guy that they draft? I think they draft a running back relatively high. And that's, a, that's more of a, you know, a, not a B. John Robinson, but a B. John Robinson type guy. Yep. And you, it, you gives you that, that outlet. Um, the, the, the Packer, or excuse me, the Miami Dolphins brought in Kenyon Drake when I was there and he was, he was the backup to, to Derek Henry at Alabama and nobody really knew who he was. And unless you started watching his tape, he's like, Oh, he's the guy that rips off 70 yard runs once a week. Yep. You know, and so you can find guys out there that are that kind of change of pace guy. I think they do still need that. I don't know that I don't know that today the Packers are net better in the running back room. I'd say they're net worse in the running back room for Aaron Jones not being there. Um, but I don't know as you look at a 17 game season plus playoffs, knowing that Josh Jacobs could probably play the entire time. That's what you're betting on. You're probably looking at that going, I'll I'll take the coin flip. Yeah, that's where I'm kind of at with it as well. And you put it picture perfectly of like, we all remember the last couple of years when Aaron Jones is healthy and as good as pretty much anyone. And like you said, the lighter fluid of the offense and makes everything go. And it's not a, it's not happenstance that when Green Bay took off offensively last year, it was when Aaron Jones came back from injury and the offense just took off. 
But at the same token, there have been a lot of injuries. Even at another one that kind of went under the radar against San Francisco at the end of that game where they basically said they didn't even know if they beat San Francisco, if he was going to be able to play against the Lions, had another hamstring injury come up. So you're starting to get these in bunches now at his age. I think that's the bet that Goody is making is that, hey, we think... You know, even if even if Aaron Jones is better than Josh Jacobs, we think 17 games of Josh Jacobs is better than 10 games of Aaron Jones, and that's what we're ultimately betting on. It, it, you put it perfectly as well. It sucks, but I can at least understand the vision and understand the philosophy if that's the way that they wanted to go. Yeah, I, you can always sit here and go because you don't. You, we just don't know how that plays out. And I think for the last couple of years, the other thing is when you look at the beginning of the season, a lot of times. I, I found myself going, why is A.J. Dillon in the game? Yep. A lot. And you always said, oh, because they're trying to preserve Aaron Jones. And they'd even talk, I, you know, you, you'd get uh, you'd get Lance and those guys and Wayne talking about it on the on the pot, on the on the telecast. Yep. But at the Green Bay Packers now, and I, I just don't know where they're at as far as are we going all in? They're a young team, obviously young on offense. And they're, you look like you, you feel like they're going to be good for a couple of years, and you don't really know if the window is like 2024, 20, 2025 season. But if it was 24, 2025 20, season, then I would have, I would argue that you should have just kept Aaron Jones, paid him seven, eight million dollars, whatever he wanted, and then done this next year. Yeah. So I think this is also kind of a signal that, like, hey, look, we understand that we're going to be good for a number of years, but we don't necessarily know that we're going to be better than like the Detroit Lions or whoever, the San Francisco 49ers. And we're going to be actually be a legitimate Super Bowl contender this season because I think you take the bet because Aaron Jones is such a special player and, and his statistics don't do him service as far as how good he is and how valuable he is to the Green Bay Packers. Um, if you can get him in a playoff game versus any of these other these other guys that you can bring in, like he's the better player. And so if it was an all in moment, maybe you say. I, I'll bite the bullet and pay, but I, maybe they're signaling a little bit like this isn't an all-in moment for us. Yeah, I get that as well. Is there, and I'm not saying this is the case with Aaron Jones, but has there been a time where maybe there in your career where you played with somebody where there was a certain outside perception of a player that was still really good, but like in the locker room, you could be like, man, this guy is like hanging on by band-aids and bits of string and like, his, like it's, he's just breaking down to the effect. And, and is there, could there be a possibility where the Packers see this from a locker room standpoint of like, yeah, he's great, but he's like, you know, one or two plays at any given Absolutely. moment. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I could talk about a countless amount of players where the the outside perception is that, oh, this guy was, he's a warrior. He's he's done all this stuff. He's played injured before. He's played through this and that. He's played at a high level. He's, you know, maybe seven, eight, nine, ten year guy. And you're in the locker room every day seeing him and he's struggling and they're not able to practice. I mean, how many guys you look, you, you hear about now that just don't practice on Wednesdays or Thursdays? Yep. I mean, so, the, I mean, it's a real thing in the National Football League. I remember, I, I don't want to name any names, but there's, yep. there's so many guys we could talk about who, the outside perception is, and it could be that they're playing at a high level. I'll tell you one guy. You remember Bruce Matthews, right? Oh, yeah. Bruce Matthews was playing like his 18th year. It was ridiculous. And I remember Justin Hartwig, we picked him up in Carolina. And Justin at one point was like switching time with Bruce Matthews when he was in Tennessee. And I remember watching, and Bruce is a Hall of Famer, and Bruce is better than I ever was. And I'm not, we're not bad mouthing Bruce Matthews right, right now. Right, right. But, but his last couple of years, everybody, he was still making Pro Bowls. Oh, it's like Jeff Saturday. Yeah, I was going to bring up Jeff Saturday. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but it's like he's making Pro Bowls, and he was literally starting the first series, and he was getting his, he was getting it handed to him, and he sat the rest of the game, and Justin would come in and play, but it was like the outside perception, the fan base, and everything like that drives, that does drive a lot of decisions that maybe like I don't like to give them any credit sometimes because I'm like why why would anybody make a decision based on what the fans want? Like do it what's in the best interest of the team, interest of the team. But the reality is like the fan base does drive a lot of stuff, especially if you have an owner. Yeah. And I know there was a lot of Fridays that I was there at practice and uh, Aaron Jones, you know, you could tell he wanted to go out. He's, he's, you know, chatting with his teammates and doing everything, but he just couldn't get out to practice and he was doing the rehab work with everyone. And um, you just wonder if they saw a lot of that and said, Hey, like the, the, the timeline here for, for Aaron, it's, it's more likely than not that he's going to miss another seven, eight, nine, ten games next year than it is that he's going to play 14, 15, 16 games. And that's why they ultimately have to go to that decision. Obviously another decision that is completely injury based was the David Bakhtiari one. So another one that I know has been dissected, you know, to, to death at this point, but uh, I know you and I both have, 
just the utmost of respect for Bakhtiari and what he does on the field from a technician standpoint and how great of a Green Bay Packer he was. Uh, so it'd be remiss not to ask you about uh, his you know time ending in Green Bay. Yeah, I mean, I think like for me, he's the best. He's the best lineman I've seen in a Packers uniform. I mean, that's the easiest way to put it. He's the best I've seen. Yeah. So, and I've seen a lot of good ones. And is you know over the last 30, 30 years, forty years, like there's been a lot of good guys go through there. And, and we've had a lot of good offensive lines, but he's he's the best guy that I've seen. He's the and, and I don't even know how close it is. Um, he'll he'll be a gold jacket where he'll be you know the first ballot. I just you know when he retires, if it's this year or next, you know he's he's gonna. There's a lot of ceremonies he's gonna be invited to here in in the very very near near future. Um, great personality on and off the field. Just love what he brought to the game. I love the professionalism. Uh, not never a like always felt to me. There's two kinds of dominant players. There's like the there's the Trent Williams who you're just or Larry Allen or you just you're yep. the guys are scared of. Like I remember getting into a getting into a, a line at the pro bowl uh, against like, we're just like doing walkthrough with Larry Allen and the defensive linemen were like, they're, they're still like legitimately scared of him. I thought he was, I thought he was over the hill and they're like, please don't hurt us. And I go, Oh, they're still, that's why he's here. Cause he's, he's not playing very well, but they're still scared of him. So him and Trent, the guys like there's guys like that. And then there's guys like Joe Thomas. There's guys like, like Bach where they just don't make a lot of mistakes. Right. And it's just, you get the same thing every time. And you just, it's almost like, Watching Bakhtiari is almost like scratching your head because you're like, dude, like he is, he is uh, almost with all the different stances and everything. But when he takes his first kick slide and then settles, he's almost in the same spot every single time. And nobody knows how to, nobody could crack that code. And that's just like, for me, that's the true mastery of something when you're not relying on over athleticism. You're just relying on, I'm so much better technically from a football IQ standpoint than you are. Uh, it, it's just the ultimate. I think, I think it's the ultimate in professionalism, man. It was, it was a lot of fun to watch him. It's one of those players where you turn on the tape every single week and you just, it's just, it's almost so perfect. It almost just looks like he's on like cruise control at times. And I say that in like the best possible way. That's not a knock in any way. Of course. Um, it just, it, it, I always uh, likened it to the matrix where, you know, Neo puts the hand behind his back at the end and is fighting, you know, Smith at the end, just the one handed because he's just like, he's so advanced uh, that it doesn't even matter anymore. It's like, I could do this in my sleep. You can, I can pass that like this and I, you can come at me all day and you're not going to get past me. And just the level of consistency over and over and over um, machine-like. And it was just an absolute joy to watch. Bum that, again, you talk about things that suck. It sucks that he had the injury. It sucks that he hasn't been able to finish out his uh, career the way that he wanted to, the way that the Packers wanted to. Uh, I go back to the the Bears game this past year, the one game he played. He plays one game. I guarantee you he's probably, what, you know, like 75% of what he would like to be, maybe even less than that. He's still like the best player on the field in that one game. And not even just, close. Yeah, yeah. It, not even close. He, it's he unbelievable. Was he was amazing. And the, you know, the one thing that always sucks about getting hurt is there's that there, that small, but loud contingency on social media who starts calling things that, you know, like they want to see it or just trying to create, you know, trying yeah. to create havoc. And uh, I, I think when it's you know, a lot of people leave green Bay, I know this firsthand and you're a lot better when you leave than when you were there. And I think people are as good as he was. I think people are going to recognize how great he was in the next couple of years. Yeah, I hope that's the case because he certainly deserves it. Um, speaking of greatness, hopefully Green Bay found another great player in Xavier McKinney this offseason. Obviously a huge free agent addition, somebody that theoretically should fit perfectly in Jeff Halfley's defense. Uh, your thoughts on the signing of Xavier McKinney and how he fits within that, probably that post-safety role in Green Bay. Yeah, so I know I know that Halfley came out and said that he wanted a post-safety guy that could wipe out part of the field. What was interesting about McKen so McKenney's a really good player. He's he's young and he's already like so accomplished. It's amazing. Yeah. He's not a he's not a huge guy, but he's he, he's an Alabama defensive back man. Like yeah. if you want to bet on the stock market or you want to bet on horse races, like go take your money and bet that an Alabama defensive back is going to be good because those guys they're always they're just always good players. So um, I what I found interesting about Xavier McKinney, kind of looking into it, was you know he played the star before Brian Branch. In the Alabama defense. And yep. so then you start going, well, wait a second. At New York, they're playing him 20 yards off the ball. They're playing him in the box. They're they're blitzing him. And I don't know that he's at he's equally good at all three of those. Like he needs there's some coaching that needs to be done. It's certainly as, as he gets closer to the line of scrimmage. But you could put him in that star position <clears throat> and really have him have a, a, a just a massive, massive. He's one of those guys that's so good and um 
I'm trying to remember the name, of course, of, of Mika Fitzpatrick, who was yep. we had drafted in Miami and they got tr- traded to Pittsburgh. We were all when he got drafted in Miami when I was there, I just remember everyone was just like, he's he's a standard deviation better than anybody else as yep. far as just the way he moves, the way he thinks about things. And I think what you're getting with this guy is one of those players that on the back end, you can really cornerstone and build everybody else around. You could certainly do that. You could talk about doing that with with a really good deep, uh, a cornerback like, like Zier. But when you think about the safety position that can go into run the nickel slot, could probably play against their tight end, can play the post safety, can play in the box, you can, you can blitz them off the edge a lot. When you talk about a guy who has that kind of versatility and he's really kind of an, an, an A guy at everything, it opens up the doors. And now you have the ability to go draft a younger guy that he can he can mentor, which I think is maybe just as important as anything else. Yeah. And the other thing that's huge, and, and I think people have said this before, but both the guys they brought in that were big big name guys are captains. They're, they're team captains. Like yeah. That's a big, big deal. I'm sure Goot uh, had that in mind when he brought those guys in, f- particularly filling the roles that they need to fill. Um, one being that DB room, another replacing Aaron Jones. But having that C on your chest is, is is a big deal as well. I'm excited about that move. I'll be really interested to see now what they do to fill that other spot because I don't know that that guy's in the building right now. I don't think he is either. And to your point, uh, McKinney can be that, you know, it's overused, but that Swiss Army knife, that chess piece, whatever lame cliche we want to use, uh, assuming that they get players at those other positions that allow him to move around and don't pigeonhole him into that one position. So to your point, I think what they do at the safety room, what they continue to do at corner uh, will dictate as well as to where they use McKinney the majority of the time and just how flexible they're going to be able to be with him. Again, dependent upon what else they add to that room, which I think is going to be a really interesting storyline via the draft. Um, other from a free agency standpoint, anyone else that they did resign, didn't resign, um, you know, obviously they get Keyshawn Nixon back on the big deal. You see John Runny Jr. Leave Darnell Savage is gone. Jonathan Owens is gone. Anything that surprised you or, uh, you know, that you want to comment on from the rest of free agency? Well, I, you know, Jonathan Owens, it was kind of a coin flip guy. If you could get it back for cheap, if you got a deal that was better than he get here, you're happy for him. Certainly. I, yeah. you, I don't think he's a, like a, a finality answer, but you know, he's certainly a guy that I thought stepped in and did a good job with the opportunities that he had. Um, key, getting Keyshawn back, uh, Nixon back was huge. It's going to be really big now with that new, the new kickoff rules. I think he, you, you know, that new kickoff rule is going to exploit uh, in a positive way, some of this, the really good special team coaches out there with their ingenuity and understanding what kind of players need to be on the field now. But I think a guy like Keyshawn Nixon is going to, I mean, it, it's supposed to, in theory, give you an extra four to five yards of starting point. And that's before they made the changes that they made to make it out like the XFL. With Keyshawn Nixon there now and the ability to have two doubles, I, he could have, I, I'm not, I'm not, Joking when I say he could have five touchdowns next year and, and kick off returns. Like it could be that big of a deal. So I'm excited about that. Um, as far as the guys they didn't retain, listen, I think they're writing on the walls for John Runyon Jr. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled that he made as much money as he did in free agency, quite frankly. Like it's I, I think he's such a good dude. And you know, I watched tape on Josh Myers on our, on the block party show yesterday. And you know, so obviously John's on there, and it's another scenario where you you're always you're constantly carrying baggage from years past even beginning of the season with Rashid Walker beginning of the season versus end of the season we take this perception and drag it forward I, I'm as guilty as anybody of thinking of the guys one way and then you start watching film and it's like okay he's not like an a player but he wasn't bad either and yeah. and with Sean Ryan being unproven I know a lot of people like Sean Ryan it's not that I don't like him but he's unproven um, I, I don't think that he did anything to definitively win that job over John Runyon Jr. I just think the timing of it made sense. And obviously they thought that they wanted to develop a guy in the eventuality that they got rid of John. But I think if you look at the Green Bay Packers offensive line right now at, at left tackle, at center, and at right guard, you've got guys that can start, but are they your starters? And, right. and that's that's yet to be seen. I think I think that Matt LaFleur actually did a pretty good job of – signaling that a little bit at least with Rashid Walker saying hey we're excited about him but to do you know to get where he wants to go we got to be I, I'm misquoting him but you know there's got to be 70 plays of a consistent football and you could say that about all three of those guys 
totally, totally agreed. And uh, not only Lafleur said it, Goody has said it on multiple times as well. I think Stano said it about Rashid Walker. It's funny they they seem to be uh, calling out Rashid Walker more than uh, any of the other ones. And I think that's probably just because they have a, a high view of him and what they want him to be, and they want him to reach that ceiling. But they've said it multiple times for him. I'm also with you on Sean Ryan. Like I, I think he, like you said, he can be a starter. There's also some stuff on tape last year that gave me a little bit of cause for concern that he, he got beat inside on a couple different occasions for rather easily. I'm just like, I think he's going to be fine, but I don't think he's anywhere near this like finished product, set it and forget it right guard that I think maybe some people want to make it out to be. Yeah. It, and so when for offensive line, and listen, I, I work with these guys, this is like the majority of what I do. Uh, offensive linemen can get so dramatically better in one off season. Sure. But in order to do that, you have to be in the right environment. You have to be with the right people and you have to be, you know, you, you really have to be identifying, assessing and correcting the things that well, I call them areas of, areas of opportunity, but things that you need to improve on. And but my whole issue with, with some of this stuff is he's been in the building. He's been you now like last year, he got to start the things that he had a problem with in his first start, he had a problem or his first action he had a problem within his last action. So there's not that, that improvement. And when you don't see that improvement, I can point to a number of things, but I point to the room a little bit. Sure. Um, so you want to, like, you really want to make sure with all those guys this off season, it, it's like Josh Myers in his first step. Josh is a good athlete. He has the capability of having a better first step. And the fact that he doesn't have a better first step leads me to believe that it's not a point of emphasis. So, these, whether you're talking about Rashid, Josh, or or any of the players, really, if you want to become your, if you want to reach your ceiling, you really need to go and find somebody that's going to hold you accountable to the details of the sport. Otherwise, you're just going to have this slow start to the season, always picking up steam, you know, up a roller coaster deal that really isn't benefiting anybody. Certainly, it's not going to benefit you come contract time. No, and I know that's. Um, hopefully what some of the competition was, you know, meant to get the best out of people. They don't have that competition yet. I'm sure they're going to address that via the draft, but that'll be another interesting storyline via the draft. A player that I wanted to ask you about very specifically today is a player that may have seen his stock rise this off season due to a release of Devondre Campbell, um, a potential move to a four, three, and we can debate as to how much that's actually going to matter or not. But, uh, either way, Isaiah McDuffie potentially finds himself, in a situation as of right now uh, that he could find a little bit more playing time within this defense. I know Isaiah McDuffie has been somebody that you have liked and you've talked about in the past. Um, your thoughts on him, you know, maybe making that step up next to Quay Walker. I, I mean, he, he played for, at BC for the, for the D for the defense coordinator. Um, yep. He knows that he knows the system. Uh, I, I think he's one of the toughest guys on the team, at least on the defensive side of the football. I think when he walks into that room, everybody knows exactly who he is. Uh, Listen, he's going to have some deficiencies, you know, particularly in the past game. But the, what he brings to the table far outweighs what his deficiencies are. I, I really like his – I like the way he plays football. I like his mentality. He seems to be a smart player. He's, he, he has a nose for the football. He has a nose to make tackles. I thought he was – you know, you can you can say Devondre Campbell was the starter last year, and but, you know, with the injuries and how much he got to play, you got a really – you have a really good sample size of what Isaiah McDuffie is capable of. And I don't put him at linebacker two right now. I, I I look at him going, he's probably the best guy in your room. Maybe not with the biggest ceiling, but he's the guy that I would, if I had to make tackles on week one I, and I had to put somebody in today, that's who I would put in. Now, with regards to the four, three, Andy, I, I will be shocked if they don't pick up somebody that's a starter material soon. Because so many teams in the NFC now are running fullbacks and, and multiple tight end sets. And you're going to want to get into these situations where you need a you, you look. Quay Walker would you look at Quay Walker? And you, what do you? I think of Derek Brooks. Like I wish he was playing Will. I mean, yeah. quite frankly, that that's what you look at. You look at the range. You look at the speed. You look at the way that he wants to make his tackles at versus like being in the middle of the, the middle of the action with two guards and a center cut him at him. You'd rather see him try to cut angles and beat and beat tight ends and beat tackles to the with with speed moves. Um, him playing downhill. This year is going to be the, kind of the key to his maturation process. Uh, and I think if you get him in a situation where he can do a little bit more from a different position, I think that would help. But I, I just think that you're going to – one, you're going to need a guy because one of those guys is going to get hurt during the year. But two, 
the four three defense, I don't know that it's going to come back in full force, but you know, certainly when you look around the league and you see what the Niners are doing, the Seahawks are going to go this route. You see the Houston Texans are are, are, are playing. At, there's just so many teams that are going to embrace them. The, the Ravens are going to embrace the fullback, embrace multiple tight end sets. You're going to need that third guy because, quite frankly, we talked about Xavier McKinney. Like, listen, if you go and just put him in the box in a 4-2 and say, we, we, we're taking care of this, you haven't. you got a real problem because these guys don't know how to take on fullbacks. No, they definitely need that type of player. They haven't had that player in a while. Hopefully that's somebody they can find via the draft. The linebacker class in free agency has been pretty much picked completely over at this point. So it's almost going to have to come via the draft. And you, you know, too, like there, I don't think there's any chance they go into the season with just Quay, Isaiah, Eric Wilson, Christian Welch. Like they're going to have to add some bodies there. And I expect them to be pretty aggressive come draft time at that position. And that kind of brings me to my next question. Like, what do you see? We talked about offensive linemen and some competition there. We talked about that safety room needing some depth. Off-ball linebacker, we just talked about. How do you sort of stack up the, the the Packers' biggest needs and what you'd like to see the most address come draft time? Well, assuming they stay at 25, um, I, I think you hit the, the three big needs for me are I would – I would love to see just an, and it doesn't have to be at the tackle position, but it, at center, there's three centers that are that are going to be good. If, let's call Graham Barton a center. There's sure. three centers that are going to be good. Okay, uh, the Powers Johnson kid from Oregon, Zach Frazier from West Virginia, and and uh, Graham Barton from Duke. You can lock it in; those players are going to start next year. Like they yeah. are good, and they could start on this team day one. Now. Myers could also beat them out, but I'm saying if you bring a guy in like that to start, like you're not you're not going to be disappointed. Any one of those three guys is going to be a good player. Uh, there's a there's a there's a handful of guys at guard. The problem with guard is certainly Goody doesn't value that position as far as he think he'd rather draft a tackle and move him down. That whole thing gets a little bit dicey. And then at the tackle position, look, you, you talk about Joe Walt, who's going to go much higher than than 25. I'm not as in love with the Penn State kid as, as maybe some other other people are. Uh, I think some of the best guys are right tackles, unfortunately. The kid from Oregon State is really good. The kid from Washington might, might be a better guard than he is tackle, although I yep. think he's tremendous, absolutely tremendous. So there's a handful of players you could look at 25 and say we could get a tackle there. But, you know, the other thing is, do you is there is there a is there a safety or even a defensive back to a corner that you want to take first? And do you really want to go defense again in the first round? I mean, and, and, and that sounds silly to say, but we got what, eight guys, seven guys over there from the first round, you know, so eight of the last nine seasons or something like that. It might be time to start stockpiling some really, really valuable talent. And when I look at talent now in the national football league, I, you know, the first thing for me on the offensive side of the football has got to be offensive line. So Maybe we're looking at a handful of those tackles. Maybe we're looking at one of those the, those centers. And you know, even if you take one of those centers, you can you can split Josh Myers to or to guard, or you can move one of those guys to guard for a year, and you can have them compete. But I think there's a couple can't miss guys in the offensive line room um, that I would certainly be looking at. Sixteen of their last twenty first round picks have been on the defensive side of the ball. They have a they have a type on that That's side, which crazy. is crazy because they've been an offensive team during that entire stretch uh, while doing that. Uh, you, you mentioned a couple of the, the can't miss guys on the offensive line. Uh, are there, are there a couple of players? Um, I know you mentioned some of the guys that you like that may not be there, but are there a couple of players that are there at potentially there at 25 that you view as like, just run to the, the podium type guys? No, there's, I, there's really, not, and I'll say, I'll, I'll tell you why, because I don't think Joe all to be, I'm just looking down this list right now. So Fashanu, Fashanu is a good athlete, no doubt about it, but I, I'm not, I'm not ogling over him right now. I think that, I, I did a thing on him versus Rashid Walker. Rashid Walker is a better player right now, quite frankly. Sure. Uh, you go down Fuaga. Fuaga. People are people have different opinions of Fuaga, and, and there's some there's some stuff that he puts on films that's exciting. He's not nearly as as athletic as Zach Tom, and he doesn't play left tackle naturally. So that's a, that's an issue, right? Yep. Uh, Troy Fautano. This guy is he's got the best footwork of anybody on this page, but he might be a guard. And he and he could very easily. He reminds me of Skaronsky last year from Northwestern. That you know, sure. and so what happened to him? He goes to he goes to the Titans and he's playing guard now. And I don't know that they move him back out. Quite frankly, yeah, I don't think you know, so. They, yeah, they they might just keep him there. So there's a couple guys here. Uh, the kid from the kid from Oklahoma's got some good feet. Uh, I I also thought. Listen, that the kid from Alabama, J.C. Latham. Yep, he's a he's he he moves really well for a big guy. And I again, I'm always. I am a little bit scared of drafting Alabama 
offensive lineman. It's for not sure. been great. Yeah, yeah I, I'm a little. You're, you're always a little bit scared about that. You want to take everybody as their own entity, but I don't know at that school. This is crazy to say because I just praise their defensive backs, but it seems like they get by on athleticism until they get to the league more there than maybe some other places. So I really like. Um, Listen, I, I have some, you know, I know some guys at Arizona. Jordan Morgan's a guy that's on this list. I, he's not a first round pick for me. Uh, so I don't really, when I look at this this group, I know there's a kid from Georgia. The kid from Georgia last year was amazing, Broderick. But but at 6'8, 340, look, there's a point where you're too tall to play smaller players, right? Because yep. it's like you watch, uh, watch, watch the Makai Becton tape versus like Miles Garrett. Miles Garrett's 6'5, but he bends like he's 4'2. Yep. Like Beckton's too tall. He can't get down. Watch Jonathan Ogden tape versus Dwight Freeney. He can't, you can't get that low. So there's a point in, in height where I have, I start going, okay, you're actually too tall. There's like, it's a bell curve, right? It's not just an ascending like bandwidth, right? So um, I, I just don't know that there's a guy. I love Fautano. I think he's so good. I think he's so good. And I think the Oregon State kid is, is going to be really good as well. We just don't need a right tackle. But I don't know that the Packers would take. I don't know that they take the, the Washington kid Fautano at, at, at 25. And, and I just don't know that uh, I don't know that anybody else on this list is, is going to be there that I wouldn't take powers, Johnson, Zach Frazier, Graham Barton over. Yeah. Barton makes so much sense because he does have that versatility too. And even if they, like, I think he could be somebody that competes with Sean Ryan at guard. If you don't want to mess with Josh Myers at center, I think you just kind of find the weak link and say, all right, where do you want yeah. Barton to play too? Um, but they haven't, like you That's said, they, have, they haven't Sorry. valued the interior offensive line at that spot. Um, but it gets weird too, because if you do take a tackle, which they have valued, well, all right, then you're going to move Zach Tom, um, which you probably don't want to do. And if you do, then you're not really drafting somebody to take over a tackle. You're, you're moving somebody into guard so that they can move it to, so that they can play a tackle or you're yeah. benching Rashid Walker, which right. I know he has like work to do too, but to me, he's not one of the bottom you know, even maybe one or two, like he's, I, I like him better than, than Myers or, or Ryan at this point, but it just yeah. gets to be a really interesting conversation. Yeah. The, I did a show on, on Rashid Walker and I try to template against, you know, these, these guys and listen, I'm, I'm not in the building, but I, I didn't even look at Joe Walt. Cause I think he'll go top five yeah, or top sure. six, but the rest of these guys, except for Fuaga, who's not going to play tackle. I don't think. I don't think that they're better next year than he is. And I, and I, and I think his ceiling is, you know, relatively speaking, um, as high as, as most of the guys on this list. Uh, the thing about, I don't think you move Zach Tom period, you know, okay. even if they, if they drafted the Fuaga kid from Oregon state and it's like, well, you're not playing tackle buddy, or you're not playing right tackle. You got to go home and play left. And, you know, maybe they think that they have the developmental team there with Steno being the offensive coordinator. They could do that. Um, I, but you, to your point, there's, I guess the bottom line for me is I don't think that there's guys on this list that are better than Rashid Walker at the end of the year last season that we're, where he's building from. I don't think that they're better than he was at the end of last year going into the, the playoffs than, than, uh, than I saw on tape for, for these guys. And I do think that – I don't think Josh Myers played bad, but I do think those three guys are really good. I really do too. Jackson Powers Johnson is a really fun watch. I, I wanted to ask you about one of the guys you mentioned, um, Guyton from Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also a little bit on the taller, six seven. I think yeah. one of like maybe three twenty eight side. Um, I think sometimes I played against him. You could see him get out leveraged at times. He also got a little bit ahead of himself at times and kind of overextended himself. But um, he, outside of the the height and the weight. He hits a lot of the athletic stuff that Green Bay likes. They usually like to take a little bit more of a, a project player that they think they can develop into a big-time uh, offensive tackle or a premium position player. Mm -hmm. He screams a little bit off the page. Again, you get into the issue of he's probably a right tackle, which is a bit of an issue when you have Zach Tom there. But yeah. um, your thoughts on him? Well, I think you just said it. Uh, he's a project. I don't think he's like I don't think he's the first. I don't think he's a first-round answer because of that. Uh, I don't think that he's a left tackle in the NFL. I really, I, I'm probably more so like this than other people, but I just, my experience is there's a certain height that you get to. It's just really, really hard to bend. And the 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 way that if, if you just look at the last 20 years of offensive and defensive line swings and like body type, like it when it changes, if you get caught, 
in like an extreme, you're in a lot of trouble, right? So like when Aaron Donald showed up and everybody thought his RAS score, like his, his height was a problem and everybody realized, oh, wow, he's just got incredible leverage and he's going to beat everybody and he can get underneath everybody's pads. Um, the same thing happened with the Indianapolis Colts when they when they had Mathis and, and Franey. Like this happens and it just goes in swings. They went from Ted Washington to Aaron Donald, you know, for a, yeah. in an extreme example, right? So if you don't have that, you know, if you don't have that like, six foot five 315 pound guy or six foot five 320 pound guy you've got like a six eight six nine 340 the, there's two things that happen this happened with Mackay Becton I would hate to bring Mackay Becton I'm sure he's a good guy or like with Evan Neal you start looking at big guys and you go okay what are the two things that you're always worried about well play speed and injury and both those guys can't play that fast and, and get injured. And everybody says, oh, they move so well for, I move so well for a six foot eight guy. I move so well for a 355 pound guy. But I do I move well against a 275 pound guy? That's that's what the question you need to be at, you know, answering. And I don't, I think we do a bad job because we fought, look, watching impressive dudes do impressive stuff is awesome. Yeah. But it's either, it's a very simple equation. Like, is Jordan Love going to be upright at the end of the play or not? And if, if the answer is no more often than yes, because of the guy you draft, like don't draft. Him. Yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. Um, just really quick before I let you go. I know you mentioned that that linebacker spot is being, I don't know how much you've dug into the linebacker position yet. Is there a linebacker that you feel would fit really well next to Quay? I, I haven't dug into it to, to be honest with you. And, and uh, I think, I think that I wouldn't be surprised if they drafted a veteran or excuse me, traded for a veteran. If they drafted one, that'd be amazing. That but, if, be amazing. But, but if they could trade for a guy, uh, it, it wouldn't shock me. Um, I, again, I go back last year, and I just keep thinking of, the, uh, of Jack Campbell, Jameer Gibbs, and you know the Detroit Lions. You know, first couple rounds. You know, really the first four draft picks, and everybody was kind of, oh, how silly! What, what are you thinking? And I just remember going, this is the smartest draft of the entire league. And every one of those guys paid off huge. And I, I'm just not a I'm just not a proponent of slotting running backs lower now or sliding middle linebackers lower. Like if you think that it's the best guy that you can get, man, you need to go get him. Cause I, I really do believe the Packers are looking at year like two to five years from now, they have to be thinking this it's Super Bowl or bust, because that's the window. You know, especially now with Jordan Love's contract and all this kind of stuff and, and what's going to happen. Like, you need to get some really, really good young players that are going to be able to play right away. Totally agreed. And I think that's what makes the sort of the story of this NFL draft so intriguing for Green Bay. Five picks in the top 100, 11 picks overall. A team that's ready to go and compete right now. Their usual draft philosophy of draft and develop, but needing guys who can come in and help them right now. It's all going to be very interesting. And like some of like, y you hit it perfectly too. Like, I look at this and try to figure out who at 25 is like this perfect fit for Green Bay. I, I struggle. I don't find this like exact perfect person. But that's what kind of makes it even all that much more intriguing. Mike, it is awesome catching up with you. Obviously, a, a really fun offseason for Green Bay so far. New defensive coordinator, some big new pieces, some players that we had to say goodbye to. And of course, we've got the draft coming up as well. Uh, tell everyone where they can find all of your amazing work uh, over on your channel. Yeah, Block Party. Uh, check it out. It's on uh, our uh, Process to Perform channel on YouTube. You hit me up, Mike Wall60 on an X, Process to Perform on Twitter. Andy, thank you. It was always, always fun talking to you. Yeah, I'll have to catch up either uh, right before or right after the draft to kind of get your thoughts on everything. Always great catching up with you as well. Make sure to go follow him. His channel is absolutely amazing. Uh, of course, you can follow him at MikeWall68. You can follow me at Andy Herman NFL. That's going to do it for us today, though. Until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.